said, I'd be really, I mean, I would love to meet with you if you're interested in chatting some more after this talk. So please let me know, uh, let Nick know, or you can just contact me directly if you prefer, okay? All right. So for this talk, I will discuss what we know about planetesimals here in our solar system, what we know, what we know about planetesimals in other so solar systems, and what whether meteorites can be used as, as an analog to study planetesimals everywhere. So I will briefly discuss meteorite outgassing experiments that my PhD student Maggie Thompson is working on uh, to better constrain atmospheric models for extrasolar planets. And then I want to discuss one of the fundamental assumptions of our meteorite outgassing work, which is that uh, meteorites are suitable analogs for planetesimals in extrasolar systems. Uh, we have very recently began working with Joanna Teske uh, to put together a review paper on this uh, topic. So let's start with the basics. Uh, you know, what are planetesimals and what do we know about them? So planetesimals are small planetary bodies that form almost immediately following the solar system's formation. They form through collisions and sticking of uh, dust particles and pebbles. Uh, this is the accretion, core accretion model. Um, their sizes vary, but basically they are thought to form be around a few meters to hundreds of kilometers um, in size. With time, most of the planetesimals uh, were gobbled up, basically went into forming the sun, or they went to building larger bodies through collisions between planetesimals or be uh, between protoplanets. So asteroids and comets are remnants of the population of planetesimals that went into forming the solar system, but most of the material in our meteorite collections are from asteroids. So it's really awesome that meteorites provide a geological record of the population of planetesimals that went into building the terrestrial planets, and they can potentially help us understand planetesimals and terrestrial planets in extrasolar systems. So asteroids, um, basically they're remnants of rocky planetesimals that formed in the inner solar system. Most of them are found in the asteroid belt and they occur in a wide variety. And I just wanted to show you some of the ones we have close-up images of. Uh, Eros is, um, Eros and Itakawa, these are ordinary type uh, material, so ordinary type chondritic material. And uh, I'll go a little bit later about uh, the variations in uh, meteorites that we have, but we have this uh, type of material in our me meteorite collections. Here are some asteroids um, that are really interesting because they're, they're the focus of current sample return missions. So this is Ryogu and Bennu. And um, so these are carbon rich uh, asteroids. Um, it's not exactly clear what these planetesimals look like originally because they've been battered and reconfigured uh, by uh, billions of years of impact collisions. Okay, so most of these objects are in the asteroid belt, as I mentioned. So this graph shows what we know about the compositional diversity of planetesimals. So this graph is showing the mass of material in the asteroid belt uh, relative to the distance from the sun. And so the information for different asteroid groups are highlighted in these various colors here. So the carbon rich ones are these uh, uh, bluish colors or lines. And then the, re the red ones are the um, silicate rich uh, asteroids. So what you can see from this is that uh, it's a well mixed um, in terms of compositional 
uh, diversity of these, um, these planetary bodies. But how exactly did these compositional variations arise? So they could have formed as a res um, formed in the asteroid belt. So as the static disk model suggests. So in this model, water ice, the water ice line basically occurred where the current asteroid belt is. And that line basically divided the region between where rocky planetesimals formed and where icy planetesimals form. So in this model, the asteroid belt is basically um, separated into the anhydrous um, planetesimals and the icy planetesimals in the outer part of the disk. It's also possible that uh, the water ice um, planet, water ice rich planetesimals form beyond Jupiter and so and were mixed in during giant planet migration. And so this is what this more dynamical model is uh, showing. So in this model, rocky planetesimals formed within the orbit of the asteroid belt, icy planetesimals form beyond that. And then the migration of Jupiter and Saturn and the ice giants uh, leads to vigorous mixing of these, um, the population of asteroid or planetesimals. And, um, and that occurs within 1 million years. And so and then Jupiter's growth basically blocks further mixing. And so this dynamic, dynamical model seems to better explain the, the um, wide, uh, the well-mixed um, composition of the asteroid belt. And so it's, it's been generally the preferred model for explaining the compositional diversity of the asteroid belt. Overall, planetesimals, I mean, so overall meteorites tell us that there were more or less three types of planetesimals. The differentiated ones that have a metal core and a silicate mantle. Uh, these were heated enough to melt the rocks. These planetesimals were relatively anhydrous for that reason. And then there were metamorphosed planetesimals, those that had enough aluminum 26 heating uh, aluminum 26 to uh, experience heating, but not enough that they melted. And so um, these are less, more volatile rich than the differentiated ones, but less volatile rich than the primitive um, planetesimals that did not experience enough uh, heating. And so they retain um, a composition that's volatile rich. Um, and he, you can see here the degree to which these uh, planetesimals experience heating is related to the amount of aluminum 26 that was incorporated during their formation. Okay, so a closer look at these samples. Um, so this chondrites are basically a sedimentary rocks of sorts. They're a mixture of different uh, different rocky material that formed under different conditions in the disk. And so they're great for um, trying to get at nebular conditions in, um, in the disk. Um, and you can see the different components, the CAIs, the oldest objects, and chondrules, which make up the bulk of these, this material. Uh, on the, on, oh, on your left, I forget now, on the right is, um, uh, image of a basaltic meteorite. And so the reason why I showed this is because partial melting of chondritic material produces basalt. And this is the most common igneous type of uh, igneous rock type at the surface of terrestrial planets in our solar system and, and likely in other solar systems. Okay, and so the Chondrites in our collection have a wide range of compositions. Um, and that's not really, you know, this shown here in this diagram, but it's not really obvious. I'll explain it. So this is showing um, the different meteorite groups, the chondrite groups, uh, not all of them, just a subset of them. And it's just, you know, all of these groups are, th the bulk compositions are similar. 
And then within those groups, they have uh, different degrees of thermal alteration and fluid alteration. And that's shown by these uh, uh, designations here. And the driver for these variations, again, is um, heating, varying degrees of heating from the decay of aluminum 26. Okay, so, um, so basically the questions motivating my work, so I'm very interested in meteorites and what they can tell us about planet formation and uh, nebular conditions. And since we know planets are common across the universe then planetesimals should be common as well. And so um, I'm interested in how meteorites can help us understand planetesimals and extrasolar systems. So what kind, kinds of planetesimals form, form in extrasolar systems? How do uh, planetesimals influence the bulk composition of the exoplanet, so the, including the atmospheres? Uh, can we infer the composition of planetesimals from, teles from observations of young stellar um, objects? And um, can the disk of sun-like stars help us piece together the, uh, the formation and evolution of planetesimals in our own solar system? So for our meteorite outgassing study, uh, we are concerned with planetesimals as a reservoir for volatiles uh, for the early atmospheres of terrestrial exoplanets. Um, so during planet formation, a atmosphere could form either from accreting nebular gas or outgassing volatiles or a combination of these two. Um, the early atmospheres of terrestrial planets are thought to form primarily from outgassing during or after accretion. Um, so both, both chondrites and achondrites contribute to building terrestrial planets. Um, however, chondrites are more abundant in volatiles and so they're well suited for studying outgassing of volatiles during planet formation. Achondrites are relatively volatile poor um, due to the differentiation process. And so, and because of this, they contribute relatively less volatiles to the growing uh, planet. Um, so yeah, so meteorites are the only samples available to directly test how, to test in the lab, at least, how the initial ingredients that went into building up a planet influences the composition of its atmosphere. And so this is especially relevant for characterizing terrestrial exoplanets because te you know, the, telescope ana the telescopic analysis of exoplanet atmospheres will, are the main way to understand the bulk composition of these planets and their potential um, habitability. So, Full characterization of the uh, exoplanet atmospheres is still uh, relies heavily on models. And so exoplanet atmosphere models, the evolution models require input of various parameters. So stellar and planetary pr parameters, such as the effective temperature of the star and the surface gravity of the planet. These models, um, which an example is shown here, these models then produce a pressure temperature profile uh, and then a model spectra of the exoplanet atmosphere. And then the model spectra is then co compared to the observations. So for example, um, in this figure for, from Mor Morley et al, um, the dotted lines here, the solid um, black lines are the pressure temperature curve curves. And then the, these lines, the dotted lines are the condensation curves. Um, and here is the uh, comparison between the model under different conditions, these lines compared to the, the observations. So and um, for exoplanet atmosphere models, they, these models require an input of the composition of the atmosphere. This is often assumed to be solar abundances or some multiple of solar, 
Uh, other, um, other assumptions have been made like Venus-like atmosphere, Earth or Mars-like. Um, so for instance, this example, in this example, they use 50 times solar as a composition of the exoplanet atmosphere. And this is fine uh, for giant exoplanets, which accrete their atmospheres directly from the nebula, but not so much for terrestrial planets, which produce atmospheres primarily by outgassing. Um, another important point to make is that photochemistry is very important for uh, producing better or more realistic models of atmospheres of planets, um, but they have a lot of many parameters that can be difficult to constrain. Uh, and, and, but, and these models also require um, input of the composition of the atmosphere. And the photochemical, the photochemistry depends um, on the composition itself. Here I'm showing a chemical equilibrium models of meteorite outgassing from Schaefer and Fegley. So these predict the composition of atmospheres produced by outgassing of various types of chondrites. Um, and so here I show the data for CI, which is similar to CM type. These are the most volatile rich meteorites in our collection. And then um, this is for ordinary chondrite types. These are very common, one of the most common, basically the most common meteorite type in our collection. And they're thought to represent um, inner rocky um, planetesimals. So for CI and CM con carbonaceous chondrites, these produce, the models uh, predict that they produce H2O rich atmospheres while ordinary chondrites produce um, hydrogen rich atmospheres. Um, and then not shown are EL, EL stands for ensatite, um, low iron ensatite. Uh, th these produce a CO rich atmosphere while the CV type um, produces a CO, CO2 rich atmosphere. So you can see from this work that um, chondritic material can produce a wide range of atmospheric compositions. Um, this work by um, Mbarak and Kempton, for this work, they applied the Schaefer and Fegley meteorite outgassing model compositions to atmosphere evolution models and uh, compared them to the pressure temperature profiles for super Earth exoplanet atmospheres um, to determine the types of clouds that could produce, uh, that could potentially be produced in these atmospheres. Um, so here you see condensation curves for atmospheres from the CM chondrite and H chondrite outgassing. And then these dashed lines here are the pressure temperature profiles for two super Earth uh, exoplanets. The condensation curves that uh, cross the uh, pressure temperature profiles basically indicate that a cloud of this composition could potentially be formed um, under these conditions. And so for, um, so for CM, for a CM like, uh, or a CM sourced, out, outgas source, uh, you could potentially produce um, cl potassium chloride or um, zinc sulfide clouds and for, and that's a similarly for the ordinary chondrite type source, but you also produce car, uh, graphite um, clouds. Oops, sorry. So what we hope is that these, our experimental uh, meteorite outgassing analysis can provide further constraints on these, on the parameter space of compositions used to uh, help understand low mass exoplanet atmospheres. Okay, so meteorites are the only samples that we have available right now to test this in the lab. So for 
our um, experiments, we heat powdered chondrite samples up to 1200 C under vacuum conditions and measure the abundances of the volatiles released as a function of temperature using a residual gas analyzer. Throughout the heating process, the gas analyzer measures the partial pressures of 10 uh, molecular masses. And for each run, we, do, we, we bake out the system. So we heat it up where, when it's empty, then we run a background analysis where we, we do this, the, the procedure with just the sample holder. And then, um, and then we run our meteorite outgassing analysis. Uh, the results from these experiments are the partial pressures of each mass as a function of temperature. And then we correct the data for a background uh, ion fragments and terrestrial atmospheric adsorption. Finally, we determine the relative abundances of outgas volatile species as a function of temperature for each meteorite sample. So our results indicate that if a terrestrial planet has a bulk composition consistent with CM chondrites, the initial composition of its outgas atmosphere would be water vapor rich along with significant amounts of CO, CO2, hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide. So this is actually uh, also relevant if, uh, if the, the um, even if the bulk composition is not CM-like, but the main volatile component of the mixture of planetesimals is CM-like because um, that material will produce the most um, volatiles. Um, and that's kind of from the, the perspective of the variety of, uh, the variety of meteorites we have in our collection, CM and CI type chondrites are our most volatile. So um, they produce, even a small amount of this material will produce um, uh, a lot of volatiles. So for future studies, we want to vary the meteorite type. Um, we've analyzed three different CM types of meteorites, but uh, for future work, we wanna vary the meteorite type and we want to vary the experimental conditions to uh, simulate varying conditions in the disk, such as higher temperature, higher pressure, um, and different oxidation states. So overall, here's I'm comparing our results to um, the thermochemical models by our collaborator, um, Laura Schaefer, and we, our results are more or less consistent with those from uh, Laura's models. However, we find significantly less hydrogen and uh, H2S outgasses at higher temperatures than the models predict. Um, since our experiments do not simulate uh, equilibrium conditions, it's not surprising that there are some deviations from the, the, the models, but overall, uh, the initial atmosphere of, of low mass or terrestrial exoplanets may differ significantly from the common assumptions used for uh, currently used, such as solar or multiples of solar. So these step, these experiments, you know, are a step in the direction of trying to better connect the bulk composition of, a tr of an exoplanet to the atmospheric composition uh, of the exoplanet. And uh, my student, Maggie, she will, she will continue the study by analyzing the residues from our, ex our experiments to understand the outgassing behavior of the gas species like sodium and iron and nickel which may be more uh, directly linked to the bulk composition of the exoplanet. So we're gonna, um, she's currently doing those analysis and uh, hopefully this work will um, support what the models say or will pr provide a different story. Okay, so now the question I want to address 
is can meteorites um, and the planetesimals they represent be used as an analog for studying uh, planetesimals around other stars? So uh, since planetesimals are likely common across um, the, the universe. So to answer this, we look to stars and their compositions because this is the most direct way to study the composition of the planetesimals that formed around them. Here is hopefully a very familiar plot of the abundance of elements in the sun uh, and the abundance of elements in CI chondrites. Uh, this plot is basically showing the striking similarity between the composition of chondrites and the sun's photosphere. The, compos the close agreement between the composition of the sun and chondrites indicate that the bulk composition of the protoplanetary disk where the planetesimals form was very similar in composition to the sun. So, uh, so therefore the composition of the host star can be used to constrain the composition of extrasolar planetesimals. Uh, and the, um, yeah, so the building blocks of um, the terrestrial planets around other stars. So in green, I highlighted the elements that can be measured in other stars besides the sun. Um, and I know many of you are experts in these types of measurements, but I was very impressed uh, by the number of elements in other stars that can be measured um, with uh, pretty good precision. But of course the precision is not as good as what we can do with our sun. Uh, please let me know at the end of this talk whether there are some other elements I should be highlighting here. Maybe my uh, literature re review was not uh, complete. And so I, I would really appreciate that. So meteorites, as I mentioned earlier, they exhibit a wide range of compositions. So we have uh, several different types of meteorite groups that are based on differences in their bulk composition. And this indicates that the exact composition of a growing planetesimal and planet not only depends on the bulk composition of the disk, so what you that information, you can get that from the from the star's composition, but also on the conditions in the disk, such, such as the temperature and the oxygen fugacity. Overall, studies have focused on, focused on three parameters when uh, trying to understand the composition of extrasolar planetesimals, and that's the iron content, the magnesium to silicon ratio, and the carbon to oxygen ratio. The, uh, the iron content has been shown to correlate with the composition of many heavier elements uh, other than hydrogen and helium. So it's really useful for estimating the composition of other elements that may be more difficult to constrain. The magnesium to silicon ratio controls what type of silicate minerals form, such as olivine or pyroxene. So what type of silicates you uh, produce and then the carbon to oxygen ratio also controls what type of minerals form, but whether they're oxides, like most of the material in our solar system, or whether they're carbon rich phases, like silicon carbides and graphite. Um, so this example I, I sh show, I'm showing from Bond et al. This shows simulations of planetary systems around um, HD uh, 72659. Uh, this study finds that the terrestrial planets in this system form, uh, those that form within 0.6 AU are enriched in aluminum, which is, um, uh, yeah, so they're enriched in aluminum, while those that form beyond this uh, have compositions more similar to the Earth, um, which is shown in this inset here. So now I will briefly summarize what is known about the compositions of sun-like stars, a more general population of stars and white dwarfs. And I'll discuss whether or not meteorites can provide a suitable analog for the planetesimals that form in these systems. 
<clears throat> so first, I'm, I went to look at sun-like stars or solar twins, and these are basically characterized based on their on the number of based on a number of parameters, including the surface temperature and the age of the star. And this was, you know, my first um, approach because if the composition of the star is similar to the sun, then the composition of the planetesimals would should be expected to be similar to meteorites. Um, here is a plot showing the abundance of different elements in um, solar twins relative to the abundance of iron. And uh, these values are for, are, are, uh, for the average about, of about 11 solar twins. Um, so, so zero on this plot means that the solar twin has an identical composition as the sun. Uh, overall, the studies indicate that the composition of solar twins and the sun are very similar, though there are some differences. Um, the range in these abundances are very limited compared to, compared to a more general population of stars, which I will show on the next slide. So at least for sun-like stars, I think, the meteorites could be used as an analog for the planetesimals um, in these systems. So this plot is from Gonzalez et al. And it shows the carbon to iron ratio uh, for a more general population of stars. And I, sh uh, I shaded this region, uh, this blue region is showing the full range of, observe, uh, sun of observations um, in sun-like stars for, so this is showing the full range for all of the elements. So um, this, this full range here is uh, shaded in blue. Um, so, so yeah, so you can see that the composition of the solar twins is much more limited compared to the more general population of stars shown here. Overall, studies find that the C to O ratio has the strongest influence on the type of rocks, planetesimals, and planets that form. So here are the pseudo ratios of a variety of stars with planets. The sun again is at zero on this plot. Stars that have lower pseudo ratios should have more oxidizing conditions and produce more minerals and rocks that are more or less similar to those in our solar system and common in meteorites. So um, while those with higher pseudo ratios have more carbon and less oxidizing conditions. They can produce um, some uh, oxides, but they're just less abundant, according to the work by Johnson et al. Um, so many of the these stars actually have C to O ratios similar uh, to the sun or consistent with oxidizing conditions. Um, and Johnson et al. said that uh, 0.2 on this plot, below 0.2 produces more or less um, systems that are more or less oxidizing and um, oxidizing conditions. So you're going to produce oxides in most of these um, systems. So uh, in this case, I think that uh, meteorites again are a fair analog for, um, for systems with C to O ratios like the sun or that are that produce oxidizing conditions. And so finally, I wanted to mention white dwarfs. They have, uh, they're very small and faint and they're very dense. And so um, their gravitational fields are so strong such that elements heavier than helium sink rapidly and should be, uh, should not be observed, but astronomers can see uh, heavier elements in um, the atmospheres of these white dwarfs. And it's uh, attributed to the accretion of disk material. And so these are uh, referred to as polluted white dwarfs. So these studies, uh, in, such as this one um, by Schudal, uh, they indicate that the, most of the material accreting onto uh, polluted white dwarfs are similar in composition to terrestrial rocks um, and therefore, and similar in mass to asteroids. 
Um, so this plot is showing uh, the composition of material being accreted onto 10 different white dwarfs compared to the bulk composition of the earth and cometary material. And so you could see that overall, it's most of the material is terrestrial. So again, I think all of these uh, studies of the composition of different stars supports that meteorites uh, are, can be uh, analogs to the planetesimals forming in these systems. So based on the inferred uh, composition of the, so based on the composition of the stars and therefore the inferred composition of the planetesimals, uh, meteorites are useful for studying planetesimals and planets, uh, terrestrial planets around other stars. Um, so this is particularly the case for sun-like stars and stars with C to O ratios that uh, are consistent with oxygen rich um, oxidizing environments. Um, so therefore using meteorites to put constraints on the composition of exoplanets and their atmospheres is a fair um, starting point and not just, so, we're, so it's not, so these samples are not just useful because they're the only materials we have, but also because the, the, the composition of stars indicate that they are, uh, fair analogs. So my student Maggie, she will continue working on this uh, by analyzing the meteorite uh, residues. Um, she'll analyze a wide range of samples um, and we will vary the conditions to simulate condition, different conditions in disks. Uh, she's also tracking the heavier uh, elements such as sodium, sulfur, and iron, which are, uh, which the models, uh, ex uh, predict should outgas, and um, and these elements uh, could be more directly tied to the bulk composition of the, the exoplanet. And so we're hoping to uh, help with understanding um, exoplanets with these these studies. And so uh, I I envision this work. Here's how I envision the impact of this work: the meteorite outgassing experiments and models will serve to understand equilibrium and non-equilibrium composition. So that parameter space of volatiles released during accretion and differentiation of terrestrial planets. And so they will tell us what kind of gases we can expect to observe uh, under these conditions. And then this can be used as an input into extra exoplanet atmosphere models or as a baseline for simple comparison uh, to the observations. Um, so the, the, these, this stu these studies can also help to determine important tracers for the bulk composition of atmosphere, uh, of the atmosphere and the planet. So this is, um, this is one of the, the important goals I think uh, that we would like to get from this, this kind of work. Um, for this, we need to better understand, meaning me as in the person, I, I need to better understand what telescopic analysis of exoplanet atmospheres will be possible in the near future. So I can focus um, our work on those, those, you know, those elements. So maybe water, H2O, um, maybe nitrogen, um, I, I will need some feedback from the community about, about this. Um, the other thing is uh, disk observations. So they can be used to constrain the conditions in disk around stars with planets. And then this can then inform what samples we use and what conditions we, we apply uh, in our experiments, maybe to understand a specific system. Um, and ultimately this work could better uh, could help better understand exoplanets and their habitability. So, uh, you know, I envision like if we want to understand that, so if we, so if we have the stellar composition, the disk conditions, some planetary uh, parameters, um, and we can, then we can also use the meteorite outgassing to say something about the atmosphere we expect from, from uh, a specific planet 
and compare that to the atmospheric evolution models. Um, and so to compare all of that to what's observed, uh, we, can, we can then see if some features can be explained by just meet, you know, planetesimal outgassing alone or, um, by, or maybe some features need to be explained by biogenic processes. Of course, this, all of this will have implications uh, for understanding planet formation and the emergence of life in our own solar system. So there's like a feedback of all of this work on, um, on uh, these different uh, aspects of solar system formation. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, many thanks to all of you for coming to this talk. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators and at UCSC and Stanford, uh, and also the sources for a uh, funding for this work. Thanks again. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Miriam. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, so um, feel free to raise your hand if you have them. All right, uh, Johanna, please go ahead. Wonderful talk, Miriam. Such interesting work. Um, so you were in your talk um, focusing the experimental work on the super Earth exoplanets. And so by those, I, I interpreted that as sort of the things that were really dominated by, by rocks and didn't have large volatile envelopes. Right. Um, but there's this wishy-washy space where, you know, some planets might start out with volatile, large volatile envelopes, but then those are evaporated. And so some planets might be rocky now, but weren't born rocky. And so I'm wondering if, um, if in your experimental work, if you're doing anything where you're outgassing into some sort of hydrogen or hydrogen helium dominated atmosphere, because I'm interested in how outgassing would, um, whether you'd be able to detect signs of outgassing um, in an atmosphere that started out much more hydrogen rich. Sorry, that was a long question. <laughs> no, I, um, I think I understand your question. So, um, so you're asking, so first of all, we can't do that right now with the current setup we have, but that's something we can do um, in the future with the right uh, equipment. And so I've put in proposals to uh, fund those kind of changes that we need to our, um, our, our technique so that we can do things like that, like actually change the atmosphere where the outgassing is occurring. Um, and so, you know, we could talk about that more about, you know, maybe putting that, um, putting that example as a motivation for um, why, you know, we need to continue this work. But, um, but yeah, so right now we, the outgassing, the, the heating experiments are done in vacuum. There's no, um, there's no atmosphere, but uh, we can adjust that to have a purge gas. So a gas that, <clears throat> that that's basically a background gas, either helium would be one, um, uh, arg argon, uh, we can do reactive gas, uh, oxygen, to see how those changes would influence the outgassing products. And, um, and so maybe it would, I think it would be a step closer to trying to answer your question, maybe not the full answer though. So then we'd have to, so then we'd have to see how um, so, so with something like that, we wouldn't be able to see the background gas would be there all the time. So you wouldn't necessarily see it go away, but maybe we could adjust it so that it, that did, that did happen. Yeah, we could talk about that more. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Lauren. Uh, hey, Miriam, thank you for um... A great and interesting talk. Um, I have kind of maybe like a, a 101 level question. Um, like having something to kind of touch and explore in a lab is a bit novel for astronomers. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious, where did you actually get this chondrite material? I think you, you kind of talked about a couple of different groups um, yeah. that you like crush up to put in your experiment. Um, 
But yeah, where do you get them and are they expensive? <laughs> um, you know, there's a wide range and certain ones are more expensive than others. Um, so I can go here too. Uh, this is not the full range, um, but I don't know if you can see my slides still. Yeah, you should be able to, right? Um, but we analyze these and we get them. So it's not easy to get, we get them from a meteorite um, collector. It's not easy you, to get them from the museums uh, when you're going to destroy them. <laughs> That's like, what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, certain ones like Murchison, um, this one, there's a lot of it. And so I think the museum would be okay with letting me do that. But most of the samples we get are from a meteorite collector and they can get experience, can, expensive, um, but nothing outrageous, I think. We, we're, we only need uh, three milligrams of sample. We need at least one gram because otherwise it's difficult to crush and homogenize something that's less than that. Uh, but um, you know, one or two grams of a sample usually won't break the research funds bank. My, my own bank account, on the other hand, <laughs> can't handle it. Cool, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Alex. Hi, thanks so much, Miriam. That was, a, that was really cool. Um, I had a question about the, um, I, about the comparison between the um, results of your experiment um, and the model. Yeah. Uh, equilibrium models. Um, so I, I do have like one maybe very silly question and one um, other question. Um, the, the silly question is um, on the right, uh, I didn't see oxygen and nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering um, if that's sort of something that's part of the experiment um, or whether that's, uh, it's, it's not there. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So let me answer that question. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we, I mentioned that we do lots of corrections. So one of the corrections we do is for ion fragments and atmospheric absorption. So the atmosphere, if we don't make an atmospheric correction, we do have nitrogen and we do have oxygen. But, you know, so one of the, one of the things I'm hoping to um, do with uh, improving the technique is to have a technique that where I don't, uh, oh yeah, I don't think this, I don't think my improvements will help necessarily with atmospheric absorption, but maybe. But yeah, I'll have to work on figuring out how to better um, uh, correct for or account for the atmospheric absorption onto the powdered sample. And, um, and so it's possible that I'm overcorrecting and I'm basically removing the entire signal or maybe this is all as, or maybe, you know, so yeah, it's frustrating because if we don't do that atmospheric correction, we would have nitrogen and oxygen, but when, but we feel like we have to, to be, um, to be uh, accurate. So, yeah, that's something we're working on improving. Awesome. Thank you. Is it okay if I ask my other question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, um, so the, you said the, or the leftover here is the chemical equilibrium results and the right, I guess, is not in equilibrium. Right. Um, is that sort of like, if you had infinite media, right, would it be possible for you to make an equilibrium um, situation to measure? Um, so our current experiments, so for our experiment, we, um, the meteorite is heated and then it's all under vacuum. It goes to the, goes through this tube to the analyzer. Um, <clears throat> so when the volatile is released, it doesn't uh, react with other, it doesn't really have time to react with other volatiles to produce an equilibrium assemblage. Um, and so that's what we are not, um, we cannot do. And I don't think 
uh, I don't have any, I don't know how to make that happen at this point. But um, what I think is interesting is that even though we don't have equilibrium conditions where you basically, you know, let the, you know, you have a bulk composition of CM and then you let those molecules outgas and equilibrate basically until it's not changing anymore. Um, and we, even though we can't do that, we see very similar results, uh, in, at least for the um, hydrogen and um, CO and, and CO2. I, and the, the, the interesting thing that I need to figure out as well is what, it, what similarities are, are enough? Like in what, what is, what different, you know, what differences are different enough that it's, that, that um, observations would, that it would be like observable difference, you know, would the differences in our, in CO2 for our models and the, um, and the experiments be different enough that it's observable? I'm not sure, but, um, I think that the sim similarities are, I think that it's interesting that there are some similarities even though there's no equilibrium expected for this system. Thank you so much. Thanks, Miriam. Michael. Oh, hi, thank you for an interesting talk. I have a question. So the meteor meteorites get reheated in the atmosphere when they fall to the ground and doesn't that reset the clock to some degree you have all this radioactive energy deposited in the crystals for millions of years and then when you heat it all of this stuff comes out what is the process that creates the outgassing is it chemical decomposition or is it uh, uh, yeah okay so um the atmospheric entry is not expected to affect the volatile budget very much. Um, but yes, you're right there. They are affected. Um, they are affected, but to a very neg negligible extent, I would, I would argue. So their, their, their time in the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere is very short. And, um, and maybe we are losing some water some volatiles through this process, but um, I don't expect that we're losing so much that it would matter for observations. Um, so that's my argument there. <laughs> and then uh, also, so your next question was about the, how exactly the, the, the decomposition is, the outgassing is happening. So yeah, I, I agree that you have, we have some, um, Basically, as you're heating them up, the different minerals, the minerals that are more susceptible to, to heating and will decompose first, they'll uh, break down and release um, whatever volatile. So for instance, our meteorites are, um, they're the most volatile rich phases in the chondrites are the matrix. So the matrix is actually a, a mechanical mixture of a bunch of, um, Phyllosilicates, which are hydrated silicates, and uh, certain meteorites, like the ones I analyzed, have carbonates. They have um, magnetite, which is iron oxide. oxide. So they have different um, minerals that are uh, susceptible to heating at low temperature, and those will decompose first, and they might release. Um, so maybe the five, and there's also, sorry, there's also organics in the matrix. So those will also, may also decompose and release um, uh, maybe hydrogen um, and um, carbon. But, you know, I, I think this is something I really need to look into more um, in terms of how exactly, um, what phases I expect will produce the, um, Sorry, what phases will produce the, the CO2, which probably, probably would be carbonates and the CO and the hydrogen will, and um, H2O and hydrogen is probably from hydrate, hydrated silicates. And then the H2S is probably from uh, sulfides. So like 
pyrite, different uh, sulfur rich minerals. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy, I noticed that your hand is up, but time is up and you're meeting with Miriam one on one. So do you mind asking the question during your one on one time? I don't mind. I don't mind at all. Okay. All right, Miriam, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you and, for inviting um, me. Yes, thank thanks. you very much. Very interesting. Feel free to uh, email me if you want to speak with Miriam one on one or email her directly. Thank you, Miriam. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Miriam. Good job. Thank you.